today, ironing out the cliff. The DFA Daily is 29th of June 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest posts covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today we look at the latest economic data relating to COVID and the measures being considered to help protect the banking system. But before I start, a quick reminder that tomorrow, Tuesday at 8pm Sydney time on DFA Live, we'll be joined by investment expert Damien Klassen from Nucleus Wealth. You can ask a question live via the YouTube chat or beforehand via the DFA blog. I look forward to seeing you there. Last week, the ABA reported that nearly half a million Australians, representing 1 in 14 borrowers, have deferred around $176 billion worth of mortgages. The current arrangements are set to expire at the end of September, just as Job Seeker and Job Keeper are set to end as well, although we expect some extensions beyond that. Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Treasurer Josh Frydenberg met with bank CEOs and the RBA Governor on Friday and there are confirmations that additional support will be provided to those who need it. Now, Australia's banks have pledged to continue to defer mortgage repayments for customers struggling financially during the COVID-19 crisis, but as reported, major banks are bracing for a savage increase in problems in their massive mortgage portfolios after preliminary investigations suggest that up to one in five home loan borrowers who have asked for a repayment holiday during the coronavirus crisis are still in deep financial strife. This suggests that around 96,000 borrowers with mortgages worth around $35 billion will end up in the bank's intensive care units. These borrowers have typically lost their jobs as a result of the virus, which means they no longer earn enough income to make their mortgage repayments. But this is just the tip of a very large iceberg. And unless unemployment drops fast, this will deteriorate quickly, with risks of households defaulting and banks coming under capital pressure. Thus, there is a common interest in kicking the can down the road some more, but just rolling interest up into loans cannot continue indefinitely. So it comes down to when APRA decides whether a loan is a bad loan or not. They will not want to move on that anytime soon. So ultimately, I expect to see the RBA buying bad loans off the banks and even giving some type of debt forgiveness program, given I do not see a V-shaped recovery on the horizon. The ABS released more data on the household impacts of COVID-19, including well-being, behavioural and social measures. During restrictions, 87% of households spent less on eating in cafes, restaurants, pubs or bars, 73% on public transport, including taxes and ride-sharing, 64% on personal care, 44% on clothing and footwear and 27% on household furnishings and expenditure. 94% expected their household to be able to pay bills received in the next three months. Three in five Australians with jobs attended their workplace in person in the previous week and another 18% intended to do so in the next four weeks. 29% of Australians intend to go on an international holiday once travel restrictions ease and 55% intend to go on a domestic holiday. One in five of those intend to go within the next month and a further two in three intend to go within the next six months. Almost three in four went shopping in physical retail stores in the previous week and three in four had dined in or at a restaurant or cafe or intend to in the next four weeks. More than three in four have or intend to use public recreational areas, including beaches, parks or playgrounds. Now, of course, the question is, will the Victorian spike change that? And will sections of the economy be locked down again? Victoria has recorded its highest number of virus cases since the outbreak of the pandemic, with 75 new confirmed infections. Health Minister Jenny Marcus said on Monday the cases were overwhelmingly concentrated in the northern and western suburbs of Melbourne, but the risk remained 
for the entire state. She urged all Victorians to remain vigilant as the state recorded its highest number of infections since March. Obviously, we are concerned by the increasing number and the upward trend, and we're monitoring the situation very closely, she said just a week ago. There were 16 new cases, making Monday's latest result a five-fold increase that also represents a record number of locally acquired cases. The state had a net increase of 71 cases on Monday, with four cases reclassified. Its death toll remains at 20 and nine people in hospital. It has had a total of 2,099 COVID-19 infections. APRA released their latest superannuation drawdown statistics today and has received early release data for the period to the 21st of June from 177 funds on a best endeavours basis. Over the period from the inception of the scheme on 20th of April to the 21st of June, payments made to eligible members have taken on average 3.3 business days after receipt of the application from the Australian Tax Office, and 95% have been made within five business days. Over the week to 21st of June, superannuation funds made payments to 154,000 members, bringing the total number of payments to approximately 2.3 million since inception. The total value of payments during the week was $1.2 billion, with $17.1 billion paid since inception. The average payment made over the period since inception was $7,492. CoreLogic published some data today, and their analyst Eliza Owen wrote, The stringent government response to COVID-19 has undoubtedly placed the property market cycle at the cusp of another downswing. So far, property value declines have been fairly mild. Nationally, the May Home Value Index result showed that the dwelling market declined just 0.4% over the month, and preliminary indicators for June are showing the rate of decline has gathered some momentum through the month. However, the national housing market is not one market, but a collection of many. Over the past few months, Dwelling market performance has varied by region in both a cyclical and structural way. As per historic cycles, the most expensive parts of Sydney and Melbourne seem to be leading the current downswinging. Over the month of May, dwelling values in the top quartile of the Melbourne market, that's dwellings worth 959000 or more, had fallen by 1.3% compared with a 0.6% decline across the middle of the market and a 0.3% decline in the lowest value quartile. Across Sydney, the same period saw a decline in the highest market segment, where dwellings are worth over $1.35 million of around 0.6%, followed by a 0.4% decline across the middle of the market and a slight increase in the lowest value segment of 0.1%. The graph suggests that more expensive parts of Sydney and Melbourne dwelling markets have higher levels of volatility and are at times a first mover when it comes to the direction of price changes. Research from the RBA asserts that more expensive property can react and be more volatile in response to changes in the cash rate. The performance of property markets amid COVID-19 suggests the high end of the market may also be more responsive to negative economic shocks. Unsurprisingly, Melbourne's inner city and eastern suburbs have seen the largest decline across the metropolitan region and the past two months have seen a decline in values across some high-end markets in Sydney, such as North Sydney, the inner west and the northern beaches. Perhaps more surprising is the continued decline in Mandra, which had the largest slip in dwelling market values over the past two months. Mandra dwelling values of 38% below their 2006 peak at the end of May this year. The renewed downwards pressure comes just after the Perth dwelling market was starting to enjoy a long-awaited growth phase at the start of 2020. Payroll data analysis from the ABS suggests that payroll job losses across Mandra has been 6% between mid-March and the end of May. This is not especially severe when it comes to job losses across Perth regions, nor would Mandra have been particularly susceptible to demand shock from a decline in overseas migration. However, the decline in dwelling values is off the back of a longer-term downward trend, suggesting demand conditions were already fragile across the region. The Perth South East region 
on the other hand, where dwelling values have slipped 1.2% between March and May, has recently been almost entirely dependent on net overseas migration for new housing demand. ABS regional population growth data for 2018-19 suggests internal migration over the year was negative, with about 4,500 net overseas migration arrivals. International border closures in response to COVID-19 may have created a significant demand shock which had interrupted a recovery in the Perth southeast region. Prior to this, dwelling values in the area had seen four consecutive months of growth between December 2019 and March 2020. At a suburb level, the biggest price falls are more reflective of the historical cyclical trends where the downturn is most prevalent in the high end of Sydney and Melbourne this far. At this stage, sound analysis of the change in suburb-level dwelling markets is limited to areas where there are relatively high sales observations. It appears that Malvern East and the Melbourne Metropolitan has been the worst suburb-level performer between the end of March and the end of May across the capital cities, with total dwelling market values down 4.8%. Other relatively steep falls have been seen across the Melbourne suburbs of Glen Iris, down 3.8%, Northcote, down 3.5%, Port Melbourne, down 3.2%, and Brunswick East, down 3.1%. And across Sydney, the biggest suburb level falls in demand values have occurred across Mossman, down 2.5%, Lane Cove North, down 2.4%, Manly, down 2.3%, Leichhardt, down 1.7%, and Wentworth Point, down 1.4%. As the downturn progresses, we are likely to see continued declines in inner city markets that have previously relied on international migration for new housing demand. However, as the wider economic downturn drags on housing demand, mild price declines are likely to spread, resulting in a more broad-based downturn in the next 12 months. And as reported in the advisor, broking industry stakeholders have been called to appear before a parliamentary committee as part of a review into the conduct of the financial services sector. The House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics has announced it will scrutinise the financial advice and mortgage broking sectors in a new hearing to be held on Tuesday the 30th of June. Among the groups that have been called to appear before this hearing, which forms part of its ongoing review of Australia's financial institutions, are the Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia, the Finance Brokers Association of Australia and the Australian Financial Group. Other groups invited by the committee include the Association of Financial Advisors, the Financial Planning Association of Australia, the Finance Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority, AMP, IOOF, Industry Fund Services, Stock Brokers and Financial Advisors Association. Following announcement, Chair of the Committee Liberal MP Tim Wilson said these hearings are an important mechanism for the Parliament to publicly scrutinise and hold Australia's financial advice sector to account. Many Australians turn to financial advisors and mortgage brokers to help them navigate important financial decisions such as finding the right mortgage or determining how to best invest and secure their retirement. It's essential that Australians can trust that financial advisors and mortgage brokers are always acting in their clients' best interests rather than the interests of the advisors or any third parties. He concluded, given the widespread misconduct in the financial advice sector identified by the Hain Royal Commission, it is important that financial advisors, mortgage brokers and those in the industry are held accountable to ensure that they are making the crucial improvements needed to restore trust in the sector. The hearings will be conducted via video conference and will be running from 9am to 5pm tomorrow. Finally, the AFR did a hatchet job on Alan Kohler for daring to discuss MMT. The writer of the piece was Aaron Patrick, who, who long-standing DFA viewers will know from his attacks on me, DFA, John Adams, etc. This time, the piece was titled Alan Kohler Cozied Up to Fantasy Economics. The face of the ABC's finance reporting is promoting an economic theory that argues deficits don't matter and the Reserve Bank shouldn't be independent. Out there, in the wild fringes of economics, modern monetary theory is picking up momentum. MMT, as it's known, is a panacea for troubled times. Government deficits don't matter, printing money doesn't drive inflation, and central bankers can't be trusted. Although MMT has few mainstream adherents, 
in the economics profession in Australia, the non-theory theory has picked up an influential disciple, Alan Kohler, a former editor of the AFR and the face of ABC's finance coverage. In the past week, Kohler has been pushing a pro-MMT book written by an American academic and economic advisor to Bernie Sanders, Stephanie Kelton. Kelton and the other MMT theorists offer a devilishly attractive solution to the economist's travails. Her book, The Deficit Myth, argues that governments can print and spend money without any long-term damage to the economy and therefore should freely spend during the current recession and well into the future. MMTers argue that famous examples of money printing driven hyperinflation, the Weimar Republic monetary policies helped trigger World War II, failed in execution rather than theory. The Germans should have turned off the presses when the economy could grow no faster, they say. If there has been a lot of slack in the economy, as has been the case since the GFC, then no amount of money printing causes inflation, Kohler tells me. MMT would require a structural change in how the economy is managed. The Reserve Bank of Australia would lose its independence and monetary policy setting interest rates and controlling the money supply would be subordinated to fiscal policy, which is what politicians love doing, spending money. In a practical sense, MMTers would keep the expensive JobKeeper way subsidy until employment was full again, which could take years. The Treasury's central bank division would rack up phenomenal debts that could be paid for by tweaking a few zeros in bank accounts. No new taxes needed. MMT sceptics worry about the ability of any government to cancel popular spending when the economy maxes out at full capacity, which is when MMT specifies that government spending should be reined in. On balance, I would prefer to avoid going down the MMT path because I am sceptical about politicians, says AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver. It's hard to know where it will end. Now that the ABC has decided to abolish the position of National Economics Correspondent, which was being used for reporting trips to Europe, perhaps it might appoint a trained economist to lead coverage of the defining economic event of our lives. Serious times requires serious analysis. Well, as normal, the AFR's writer filtered comments from Kohler, so he published his answers, saying, I neither support or oppose MMT. I find the thinking interesting and worth exploring. At heart, MMT is simply a statement of the obvious, that a sovereign country can and does create its own currency all the time. When a government spends money, it instructs the central bank to create the account and dispatch the funds. The gap between that and tax revenue, if it's a deficit, is later made up with bond issuance. Separately, the RBA has bought 60 to $70 billion worth of bonds on the secondary market with fresh money. The Fed, 7 trillion US, Europe and Japan are doing the same. So it isn't theory it's simply a description of what happens. The controversial ideas of MMT are that deficits don't matter and the limit on government spending is not financial. That is, the amount of money available, it's the resource in the economy available to meet demand. If resources are limited and higher demand results from printed money and government spending, then inflation is the result. That's what happened in Zimbabwe and Weimar Germany. If there is a lot of slack in the economy, as has been the case since the GFC, then no amount of money printing causes inflation. It's a direct rebuttal of Milton Friedman's proposition that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. He says, I urge you to read my two interviews on the subject with Bill Mitchell in March and Stephanie Kilton this week, and also check out Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth. As for whether governments can borrow without consequences, that depends on what happens to interest rates. If they rise, obviously the interest payments would tend to drown out other spending. But I do think that after the pandemic, all governments will have to confront what to do about the massive debt. Will austerity budgets be required to repay the massive stimulus, as happened after the GFC? Well, that might neither be advisable nor credible, and it would take many years anyway. So I think the consequences or otherwise 
of long-term government debt will have to be dealt with. I suspect, but don't know, that as a result, MMT is likely to escape the fringe and become more mainstream. And I'm not saying that monetary policy should be politicised, although I don't think central banks have actually done much with their independence apart from inflating bubbles. To which I might add, the question should be what is done with the money that's printed. If it flows to fund essential growth-giving infrastructure, that's one thing. But if it flows into the financial system and inflates as it prices further, that's something else. But then, of course, the AFR is aligned to the interests of banks and real estate developers, so they're behaving as expected. And indeed, my perspective, having read Stephanie's book, is that MNT is worthy of further consideration, given where we are. But of course, then we find that politics and economics gets all scrambled once again, and decisions are made on a political basis rather than on a rational economic one. And by the way, I'd argue that the RBA is in the same camp. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Bye.